goodness. Well, this is kind of sleepy weather, isn't it? Uh, it's good to see you this morning. Glad you're here. We are going to continue our study in the book of Revelation. Uh, we're going to talk this morning about the wrath of God. You think, well, we've studied quite a bit about that so far. Well, we're going to explain why in this chapter. Um, so we're going to, if you will, open your Bibles to the 15th chapter of Revelation, and we will, I mean, excuse me, the 16th chapter of Revelation, and we will get started on that in a moment. <clears throat> Are there any special prayer requests that we need to uh, bring before the throne of God before we get started in our lesson this morning? Yes, ma'am. Joyce. Okay. Okay. That is uh, definitely a major life change. Yes. Yes, sir. Pardon? Oh, <laughs> okay, Tom. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Having pro what is her name? G. Oh, sorry. I told you I was deaf. Well, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our God and Father, we are so grateful to you for all you do for us. And Father, we thank you that we have this uh, phenomenal privilege and opportunity to come before you in prayer. Father, we ask you to be with uh, Joyce as she is... Uh, struggling with a decision about her future and assisted living. And, Father, we know that um, this sometimes is part of life. And we pray, Father, that you will give her not only the strength she needs, but give her the comfort during this time of transition in her life. Father, we also ask you to be with Tom as he is struggling with some, some things at his uh, work. And, Father, uh, you have called us to work in this world and uh, sometimes uh, this world gets its claws in us. And Father, in their attempt to do that to Tom, we pray that you give him peace and comfort and the strength to remain faithful to you. And Father, we pray for those that he works with that uh, they too will, uh, will see Christ in him. And Father, we ask you to be with God as she's really struggling at school and some things going on there. And Father, we just pray for our school system all over this nation. Father, they are, uh, uh, they are poisoning in the minds of our young people at times, and at times they're introducing them to topics that should not be taught. And Father, they are also are environments that needs to be cleaned up. And Father, we ask you to be with all of those children who are in those situations. And Father, use us as a light and a Father. Help us to help those that come into our life. Father, be with us as we study this morning and give us comfort and strength as we realize that you are the God of this universe, the God of creation, and the God of all. We pray in Christ's name, amen. amen. In this chapter this morning, we're, we're going to see what it looks like when we gather up all of the Old Testament stories about God avenging uh, his people, we are going to look at how God not only dealt with nations back then, nations who rejected him, who neglected him, and blasphemed God, 
And we're going to see not only how he brought them down, what Revelation chapter 16 is doing is taking all of those stories and lumping them into one story and saying this is how God deals with people and nations who don't treat his kids properly. We tend to believe that the wrath of God is not going to be seen until the day of judgment. Well, let me tell you, on the day of judgment, we're going to see the full wrath of God revealed. However, if you remember what Romans chapter 1 says in verse chapter 18, it says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godless, godlessness and wickedness from men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, I'm going to have to give you a Greek lesson here. I had to go to school and learn Greek, and I want to use it every now and then. So I'm going to use it this morning to explain what Paul is saying here. To help us understand what Paul is saying in this passage, what he does is this, this word is being revealed. Now that is present tense. In the Greek, it is apokalouso. What that simply means, and, and guess what word we get out of that? Apocalypse. Okay? The root word of this is apokalouso. Now, here's what we need to understand. What this word in the Greek that he is using in the first chapter of Romans is to reveal or uncover. Now, what does this mean? It means that the wrath of God can be seen present tense in the world from the day Adam and Eve sinned. You can see the wrath of God being revealed. It is a present tense, ongoing thing that will continue until the final judgment in Revelation chapter 16 where God is going to connect it to the seven trumpets. And they seem to be connected to the seven trumpets against those who violate, neglect, or willfully connect themselves to evil. Now, these seven trumpets that are going to be revealed, the wrath of God that's going to be revealed in this chapter is not to kill. Nowhere in this chapter does he say he's going to kill them, and not the part we're going to study. The seven trumpets do not kill, but they do affect and destroy things that people depend on. What we're seeing is God pouring out the effect or the consequences of sin. Now, from the, let me just share right up front so we're on the same page. A guy comes into my office lays his hand on the desk, and starts beating it with a hammer. Now, some of you have heard this before. And it hurts. And he keeps beating it, and he says, Jack, make my hand stop hurting. Give me some advice to make my hand stop hurting. And what advice do you think I'd give him? Put the hammer down. No, 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 I love swinging this hammer. Just give me some advice so I won't feel the consequences of what I'm doing. That's what the wrath of God is. When you do something, there are going to be consequences. Every decision has a consequence. Now, if we decide to follow God, what's the consequence? A blessed life and eternal life. You try to follow Satan and you decide to follow Satan. What is going to be the consequence in this life? It's going to be pain, emotional pain. It's going to be hurt. You're going to hurt others. It is evil. Consequences. See, 
God's wrath comes in the form of consequences of wrong actions. Does that make sense? This is yes, this is no, and this is, what's he talking about? Okay. We get to these seven bowls, and this is nothing more than God showing what he does as a result and brings on the consequences of a nation that rejects him. He will come to a final judgment, but that final judgment will be the full wrath of God against all evil, including Satan. But in this chapter, we get to see these seven bowls of wrath, and they're going to be severe, but they are not the complete final judgment of God in its final form. So let's look at these seven bowls of wrath as we read about, and I'm going to just cover each bowl. I don't have the text on the screen, so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be reading the verses as we go. The first bowl is sinful man is targeted. Now let's look at chapter 16, and I'm just going to read verses 1 and 2. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on where? The earth. Okay. Where was the church at this time? On the earth. The first angel went out and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful swords broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Now, let's hit the mark of the beast right quick. Remember the mark of the beast, he said that number is 666. Who did that represent? Remember that lesson. You either choose one or the other. There is no middle ground. You choose one or the other. You choose Christ, you have the Holy Spirit marking you. If you choose the world, you have the mark of the world on you. Clear and simple. You're following one or the other. You can't follow both. Jesus, you said you either serve one or the other. No middle ground. And by the way, he didn't say you had a choice whether you're going to serve. He said the only choice you have is which one. That's the only choice we have, which one we're going to serve. Now, when God's wrath is finally poured out, there is no restraint and there is no mercy. Now, let me tell you why. The effects of God's wrath can come swift, intent, and they are meant for the purpose to punish. And so he calls them sores. No warning. When the trumpets begin to sound, when God says it's time to judge this nation, that's it. No warning. It's done. It was a warning, however, these sores are basically saying, if you want to escape the effect of what's coming, you better pay attention and repent. Now, I have a question. Does God have our permission to cause bad things to happen to people who are sinning for the purpose of getting their attention? Does he have permission to do that, folks? He doesn't need our permission. Why do parents punish their children for doing what's wrong? How do you punish your child when they do something wrong? Let me tell you how some do it. Well, bless your heart. Which movie would you like to go see? I'm so sorry that I made that rule that you just felt like you had to break because that was so tough on you. Now, that kind of child is what is talked about in Proverbs when the, pro when the proverb writer said, the father who does not correct his son contributes to his death. God is trying to get some attention. And notice, it is painful. When the fifth bowl is poured out in verse 10, we're going to see later, these people still had the sores on them. So they're sores. Now, this is not literal sores. This is figurative language saying your sin is going to have a direct effect on you, and it's going to be painful. 
Now, there's many different kinds of pain. There's physical pain, there's emotional pain, there's spiritual pain. But the pain that comes when we choose not to follow God is not going to be escaped. And God's going to pour that pain out. The second bowl is the effects that sin will disrupt life. The effect of sin will disrupt life. Look at verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood, that, a, that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. Now, what's going to happen in those days when commerce depended upon the sea, especially the fishing industry? Believe it or not, the sea was a major source of food and supplies for this part of the country. Fishing was one, but what was the other? Trade. And if the sea is turned to blood and everything in it dies, so the major source of food is gone, and the scene continues that sin has not only terrible effects on Man, it corrupts and has an effect on everything it touches. Sin destroys. Destri sin can even destroy the environment. Sin can destroy the home. Sin can wreck everything it touches. And so we get to the third bow, and the punishment fits the crime. Look at verses 4 through 7 with me. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard an angel in charge of the water say, You are just in these judgment, you who are holy and were on the holy one, and, 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 who, uh, and who were and the holy one, because you have so judged that they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the uh, altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The punishment fits the crime. In Romans 1, 32, Paul said that those who ignore God and do evil, he says something. Oh, let me back up here. I missed something. Okay, in Romans chapter 132, Paul says this, Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. I want you to look at something. Are, go are God's judgments just? To those who shed the blood of God's people, God is saying, you want blood? I'll give you blood. I'll give you blood to fill your mouths, to fill your bellies, to fill your nostrils, and blood to suffocate you. Now, there are two great truths here. The recipients of God's wrath bring on, bring their own troubles on themselves. God has done his part to bring people back to him, has he not? And God is trying to do everything he can to get their attention. But if people still reject him, if they still reject his, his mercy, if they reject his love, and reject his warnings, they are going to bring judgment upon themselves. Long ago, God warned the Israelites that if they refused to obey him, they would be destroyed. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through 20. Sin has consequences. And the second truth of the matter is that God arranges a punishment to fit the crime. 
I think that's interesting. Let's see how God does this. You remember Pharaoh? He tried to wipe out God's people, but God drowned his army. You remember Haman? He had planned to hang Mordecai and exterminate the Jews. Isn't it interesting? But instead, he was the one who was hung. Not only him, but his whole family. Esther chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, through 9 and 10. How about Saul, King Saul? He refused, in 2 Samuel 1, he refused to go out and slay the Amalekites. So what did God do? He was killed by an Amalekite. And so what happens is we get now to the fourth bowl, which is the burning of shame and disobedience. Verses 8 and 9, we read, The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and to glorify him. Fire is a symbol, or usually used as a symbol of God's justice in Scripture. Now, in this, God is showing us two things. First, how some are so hard-hearted that even punishment and its shame have no effect on some people. They will, as the suffering increases and the suffering intensifies because of their own actions, they will even go as far as blaspheme the name of God in their agony and their punishment instead of repenting. Now, how do they blaspheme God? I see it often. I see it as they are in the middle of a very painful consequence of their sin, and they blame God. It's God's fault that I am suffering. It's God's fault that I don't have money. It's God's fault that I don't have or I can't get or I am. It's always God's fault. If God were loyal and he were graceful and he was full of love, he would stop this. Well, why is God allowing the pain and the suffering to continue? He's trying to get their attention because they're going down a path that's going to kill them. And to me, the height of arrogance and blaspheming in the name of God is a man standing high on a hill when the flood is coming and God gave them 120 years to repent and Noah built the boat and they laughed and scoffed at him and then one day the rain's coming down and the people are headed to the hill because the water keeps rising and they shake their fist in the hand of, in the, into the face of heaven and say, how could a God of mercy and love let this happen and God just simply says I gave you 120 years to repent and you never did and I told you this was coming Noah building his ark was a sermon every day God's going to punish the wicked and you just made fun of him and we see it every day don't we you know what we see We see people headed to a cliff. Their life is such a life that they're headed to destruction. Their decisions are killing them. And we tell them, if you keep going this direction, you're going to walk off this cliff. And they blindly run over the cliff. And then when they hit the bottom, who do they blame? God. And they say things like, How did God allow this to happen to me? Let me tell you something. I've heard this before. I've worked in jail ministry. I've heard it from drug users and drug dealers. I've heard it from murderers. I've heard it from all kinds of lawbreakers while sitting in jail. 
how could God allow this to happen to me? God's trying to get your attention. Actions have consequences. What you're experiencing is the wrath of God. And it's going to intensify if you don't turn around. I have heard it from those who have centered their life on everything to be around themselves. And when it all caves in on them, they're mad at God because of their self-inflicted pain. This is what God does, and he's going to do it. He's going to do it to Rome, but folks, he does it to individuals too. And what we're hearing now in, Re in Revelation chapter 16 is a warning. God's warning them. You're going to start suffering pain, and you're going to start suffering financially because of your bad decisions, so I'm going to turn the river to blood. But not only that, secondly, how is this punishment going to fit the crime? This is something we need to learn. Just because God does not act immediately does not mean he's not going to act at all. Now, to bring it a little closer home, I used this Wednesday night in class, but I want to use it again today because it's, it, 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 it talks to us. If you had all the power in the world available to you, and someone treated your children like Rome treated God's children, what punishment would you bring against them? But let's think a little bit closer. Some say eternity is a long time, and it's way too long of a punishment. You go to hell forever just for a little bit of sin on earth? Okay, here's the illustration. Let's say a man breaks into this room. He has a machine gun. And let's say it takes him 30 seconds to do a lot of harm and may even kill some before he stopped. Since it only took 30 seconds for him to commit the crime, should he only spend 30 seconds in jail? You see, with God, the punishment fits the crime. What we need to understand is how horrible sin is to God and what an affront it is to God to sin. And God's sending all of these things saying, I need to get your attention. I need to get your attention because you are headed to an eternity if you don't turn around. And that eternity is going to be eternal punishment for your sin. And so now we get to the fifth bowl, and that is sin affects the nation, and it's going to affect Rome. We read in verses 10 and 11, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and the kingdom uh, was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed at their tongues in agony. It crushed the God of heaven uh, and cursed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores. They refused to repent of what they had done. It's getting worse. The intensity is getting worse. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. And so he says here, the consequences of a sinful nation and its deterioration will be brought down. And so the bowl was poured on the throne of the beast. Who was the beast? Remember, it's Rome. And now this wrath is being poured about on his kingdom. Brethren, when spiritual darkness came over the land, the result was eventually what? Rome fell. Darkness pervaded the hearts and the minds of those who persisted in their sin, and they failed to repent. All of these bad things are starting to ha happen to this nation. And rather than Rome leadership looking at it and saying, folks, maybe we need to look at what they were doing, they intensified their sin. And why did they do that? Real simple. Jesus said it in John three nineteen: men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Satan's kingdom is called 
the dominion of darkness, Colossians 1.13. So God is saying in his judgment, since you love the darkness, you shall have the darkness. It will envelop you. It will blind you. And it will suffocate you forever. This is what you want. And the pain of this darkness will be excruciating because he says they will gnaw at their tongues, they will suffer, and they will curse God. Remember, this is Rome doing this. The more they suffer, the more they curse God. History bears that truth out. They did. See, you cannot, the, the, the concept that you can battle against God and win is a falsehood. And so now we get to the sixth bowl, and the sixth bowl is the battle. Let's look at verses 12 through 16. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out in the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle in the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that they may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together with the place of Hebrews called Armageddon. Now, I want you to notice something here. I got some news for you. There is not a battle of Armageddon. Notice what verse 14 actually said. They are demonic spirits that perform signs. They go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day. They're preparing for battle, but no battle takes place. You ever noticed that before? They are being prepared, but where in the book of Revelation do we see the actual battle? No battle occurred. Now, let's see what's going on here. And remember, it's not what we think it says. It's what the early church believed it to say. Here's what they heard. The angel dried up the Euphrates River. Why? Well, has God ever dried up rivers before? You remember one called the Red Sea? That's a little bit more in the river. Exodus 14. You remember the Jordan River just before they crossed over? What did God do? He dried up the Jordan. By the way, it was during the flood season, and he dried it up, and they marched over into the promised land. And in prophecy, several times, this, this is used where God did it. Uh, it's in Isaiah, it's in Jeremiah, it's in Ezekiel, uh, Zephaniah. There's several places where God dried up rivers. Well, now, let's look at the implications of dry, uh, drying up the Euphrates River. Uh, if you will notice on the screen here, let me see if this will work. Right here is the Euphrates. If you will notice, that river separates this part of the world from that part of the world, doesn't it? Not only that, it separates Rome from the enemies over here. So guess what drying up that river would do? It would get rid of the barrier that protected Rome from the kings of the east. So what God is doing, he is indicating that he was going to remove all the barriers that protected Rome from their enemies and allow a way for them to be conquered. Did it happen? This is yes. It did. And one of the factors that led to Rome's downfall was not only her inward rot, but it was from also from her enemies from the outside. And for the godly, drying up a river a, or a river was a hedge for protection. Well, here God removes the protection from Rome's enemies. 
Now, here's the problem. The deceiver never accepts God's judgment, and he will continue that re- rebellion even when he, will, when he knows he's defeated. He will not give up. He will never give up until he is finally thrown into the lake of fire. Satan's ready for the day of Armageddon. Is he going to win on the day of judgment? When has Satan ever won? He can gather up all the forces of the universe. He still ain't going to win. That's Texas for it's not going to happen. He's not going to give up until his final day in the lake of fire. And even, and one of his tools has always been to destroy and deceive. And so he, these are gathered up for a battle, but God's going to intervene on a day. And so we get to the seventh bowl, which is Rome itself is finished, verses 17 through 21. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. And then came flashes of lightning, rumbling, peals of thunder, and several uh, severe earthquakes. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake, the great cities split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her up her, the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, fell upon men, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hell, because the plague was so terrible. This is simply nothing more than Rome is finished. Now, remember, he talks about Babylon. Now, remember who Babylon was? The false prophets came from Babylon when the Mede Persians came in and took care of Babylon, and they went down to Rome and reestablished their religion. Babylon has always represented the enemies of God. And so the seventh bowl is God's judgment is final on Rome. In chapter 17, or verse 17, she's done. It's over. Did Rome reap the consequences of treating the church in horrible ways. Yes. If you want to go to Rome today, you can see a lot of tourist attractions, but you will not see a powerful country. She's called Babylon the Great, and the next chapter she's going to be identified again in chapter 17. verse. Go ahead, mark those verses. Chapter 17, verse 9, and chapter 17, verse 18. Just, as a matter of fact, read chapter 17 next week. It's going to look very familiar to you now. So, what's God telling the church? He's going to, pull his, he's going to pour his full wrath out against those who mistreat God's people. Now, if you're the church in the early, uh, if you're the early church, and Rome is treating you like this, and you are seeing all this evil all around you and all this evil coming against you, and God sends this message to you, how are you going to feel? Two ways. It's going to get bad for them, but we have an eternal home that far outweighs anything we can have here. God does not forget his people. And so, when evil looks like it's winning... Does it look like that at times? Have you ever asked God why? Well, join the club. God's explaining why in Revelation. But remember, remember this. God's judgment is sure. It was important for the early church to remember this. And I think the church still needs to be reminded of this. When it's time for God's judgment to come upon an individual, a people, or a nation, he will vindicate his people. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 12, 
do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. For if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it, will, it is mine to revenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Brethren, God didn't put us in charge of his wrath. He's put us in charge of his mission. Go make disciples. To me, I can't think of anything more evil today than what Muslims are doing to Christians. I can't think of anything greater uh, greater evil than the the slaughter of over 6 million babies by calling it a choice. By the way, I'm going to do a commercial right quick. Go see the movie Unplanned, true story. True story. I also know this, before judgment will come, God will send some warning signs. But if they're not heeded, his judgment will be swift and it will be appropriate and it will be effective. And that is what the early church understood this chapter to mean. But secondly, remember this, God desires all men to come to him. His warnings are for the purpose of making life miserable for sinners. I mean, let's face it, parents, when your kids broke the rules and got on a road that was leading to death, you wanted to make life miserable for them so it would get their attention, right? Let me tell you, God's warnings are his last-ditch attempts as a loving God to get the attention of a doomed people. But if they persist in rejecting his mercy, their hearts will become hardened, and the only thing left for them will be facing the wrath of God. I want to remind us all of something. God does not send anyone to hell. I want to say it again. God does not send anyone to hell. He simply honors your choice. He will try to make life miserable for you as you're going down that road to death, but if you continually neglect his warnings, he does not send you to hell. He honors your choice. And that's it, plain and simple. We can either live by making the decision to honor God, and he will honor that choice. Or we can live to honor ourselves, and he will honor that choice. And that is what Revelation chapter 16 is about. No one escapes the wrath of God if they choose to ignore him. I would ask if there's any questions, but I'm afraid you might ask one. So God bless you.